Mary Oliver has talked about six things that poets should not do if they want to write better poems, and we're going to be talking about what those six things are. So the very first thing that she says poets need to try to avoid is something called poetic diction. This is an example. If you had to guess what poetic diction means, what would you say? Wait, what's the question? So the first of six things that Mary Oliver says poets should not do in their writing is they should avoid poetic diction. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of poetic diction. Um, what do you think poetic diction could be? Can I answer this question if I write the book? We'll save you for last. I okay. Maybe like overly conflated language. Can you give an example? Um, I mean, here, the sun, a golden orb, doth kiss the seas. Like, the, too much. like you're already here. The sun, a golden oh, orb. Like, why, yeah. why add the additional oh, descriptor yeah. when you're already describing the sun, which is already readily available image. Uh, the poem was made sure the sapphire words caress. I tread with delicate steps beneath, probably this beneath heaven's vast and endless dress. And probably <laughs> that right there. Sounds like some Shakespearean type stuff. Shakespearean it's a, it's type stuff. It's an attempt. <laughs> yeah. Other things? You need doll's words. Doll's words a little too much. And, yeah. and I, we're not uh, Dawson. We're maybe not a, we're not a humble wanderer, maybe? Maybe more, maybe not, but. I would say that's a bridge too far. There are other things stand out to you? Doff or Doff? Doff. Yeah, Doff. Yeah, Doff. Yeah. Okay. I think like the big thing that like Mary Oliver kind of points to is the language of, is almost like overly poetic. It's like yeah. I'm going to take something and just make it sound as extreme. You and will know I am a poet <laughs> by the time yeah, I'm right. It kind of feels like, you know, you have an assignment that says you have to have so um, 5,000 words <laughs> and you're like, dang, I'm, 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 I'm 2,000 words less than I should be. So you just start punching up mm -hmm. every single <laughs> sentence that you can mm -hmm. Some other places where I see that, so like, I think, I think one of the easier ones that, or the ones I'm glad you mentioned is like the sun, golden orb. Um, I think another one like the sea's crystalline brow, um, like this idea of nature's like sacred vow, um, even potentially like like for instance like sapphire waves. I think just in the context of the whole poem. Oh my God. I knocked into it. I'm sorry. Did she hurt you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, I think like this this especially like overly poetic language, where in a lot of cases, if we had honestly just gone for the thing it might have actually just been better like for instance maybe instead of sapphire waves maybe just waves you know instead of the sun golden orb sun you know sometimes it's just to say the thing you know too much you'll lose the reader yeah or if you're trying to read that it could be really long it could be a lot right yeah. well i think the thing that it also does is that you have opportunities to inject images into your poem and because a lot of this language doesn't virtually no help in creating the image like if you can create an image in less words than more then I think that's better and I think a lot of people they're like well I want to stretch out the amount of words that I'm using for this image and I'm like you're you're taking away from the punch of what the image is I'm gonna even take it a step further like it's language that you're adding, and in terms of vocabulary, yeah, there's a richness to it, but there's, it's, like a, it's like empty calories almost. Yeah. There's not a lot of emotional depth a lot of times added to this, and so it's like, how is this moving the poem forward towards what you want your reader to feel by the time the piece ends? Yeah. Ajane read the book. I don't know if she remembers a specific section, but what are your thoughts, Ajane? It actually made me think about something that Jericho said <laughs> in the workshop. Um, and Jericho essentially is like talking about how poetic diction in reference to Mary Oliver is the equivalent of poets 
like at the gym just flexing like for no reason <laughs> like not lifting anything heavy not just in the mirror just going crazy like with their little muscles um actually that's like sword play you know you do all the flourishes and things like that but then someone just like stabs you once you're like ah and it's yeah, like yeah yep i think i think all this is pretty valid in terms of like the poetic diction so things we want to watch out for for our own writing you know for our own pieces yeah, I used to write way long like that. Uh, that's the light I, I think it's common. Yeah, I, I think especially if people go through a phase where they read a lot of like Renaissance poetry, like Shakespeare, or if you read a lot of romantic poetry, like your 1800 stuff with like the nature images and things like that. I think if you're like, this is poetry, and then you apply it to your own stuff, I think it's. Just when I go back to some of my old pieces, I'm like, oh my God, he's way too much, way too long. And it can feel contradictory, right? Because I mean, just saying this, the thing. Like just using the sun or just using the wave, like some people might like, that's it. Like that's so, but there is an art to simplicity, and it can actually be, end up being a lot more evocative. Final thoughts on our first point: poetic diction. Pretty much. Say it. Just say the thing. Stop talking around the thing. Say the thing. You good? I have a thought. I just I'm, my brain is moving faster than my mouth. Um, I'm essentially trying to figure out the boundary possible overlap between um, between something like poetic diction and what we see in um, certain lyrical and literary work. Um, so for example, and these are not poems, but they're obviously pulling on a lot of poetic devices. For example, something like the work of Toni Morrison, something like the work of Philip D. Williams and his most recent novel, Ours, which is like really sprawling with not redundancy, because it's not redundant in the way that some of the stuff is with Mary Oliver, but like I think about the flourishes of somebody like a Toni Morrison who is like known for like, a tea kettle boiling in the most you've never seen a tea kettle boil this beautifully right um and thinking about how as a writer to know that border mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. an overlap so what strategies would you i have some ideas but we could take yours how do you when is it i don't want to say like okay to do this but okay to evoke language that might be reminiscent of this, but done in a more skillful way. I would say if the heightened language in places is contributing to the overall insight. So if we have a poem in where there is some type of rise in tension um, or conflict, and maybe the metaphor is around that kettle of boiling water, then maybe the focus on the way the steam builds. So all of the all of these things are more um, more gorgeous language is meant as a device to contrast what the insight or the like emotional um, takeaway of the poem is. So you said, because I was thinking like extended metaphor, like consistent word choices, which I think kind of this tangential what you were saying I think it comes down to intentionality you know it, it can't feel random it has to feel like that we're moving towards a central goal with the poem like how, how is it moving it how is it advancing it yeah, and I also think there's like a certain economy there that is like that's crucial I, I think about the the sun a golden orb and then doth kiss the sea's crystalline brow like, if I were to take away doth and just says kisses the sea's crystalline brow, I probably I don't miss doth up whatsoever, which means that, like, there was an intention of adding doth. Maybe it felt poetic. It felt like a poetic thing to say. But I don't see that as something that is, like, crucial to the selection. And I think that if you're writing a piece and you find that there are words or articles, anything in there that's like not needed to convey 
the message that you're trying to get across, then I think stretching, uh, what did, uh, what did Gollum say? Uh, um, <laughs> spread too, like butter spread too thin over too much bread or something like that. It's like, like you're, you're trying too hard to like spread this thing over, like spread this idea out for further than you need. And especially for more than I think the reader has interest in keeping with like that language. Like I think there's other examples where you have extended metaphor that you're able to inject a different image or you're working with more solid pieces of the same image that that still keeps some continuity and some you know, uh, like it feels like you're being reserved. Or it's like this, it just feels like you're just trying your hardest to make, you know, 10 words into 30, you know? Mm -hmm. In the interest of time, I'm going to move us to our second point, unless, Laurent, anything to add? Mm -hmm. You feel good? <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a look at what our second point is from Ms. Oliver. We have. Of course, can't do a poetry workshop and not talk about cliche. What is cliche? Been there, done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to add about that? No, I was just going to say it's saying yeah, like it's something that's well known, repetitive, and heard it many times mm -hmm. before. Yeah, I mean, it's something that's been said so often that the meaning that it once conveyed is no longer valid. Yeah. Which then begs the question where are the cliches? Uh, silver lining, clever class, I didn't write silver lining, clever silver lining. Mm -hmm. Stitch in time. Mm -hmm. Stitch in time, we're, we're literally doing some idioms here. The sun sinks low. Mm -hmm. A sinking sun, I think, just in general. The night creeps in. Night creeps in. <laughs> Save the day. <laughs> As below, so below. As above, so below. I'll take your work. Are you sure? That's, I'll take your work, okay. That one the stars will shine. Dark at bay. Even like Twilight's glow, I would say. I say the Comma. Yeah. Chock full. Chat GPT did a great job. I appreciate the possible. So, great to chat GPT. Much better than I could do. I don't even know how you can reword this one. Because <laughs> uh, if you take everything out, there's nothing left. Okay, I mean, let's maybe. Oh, you can, you can change the words around, make a different word, a different meaning. Yeah. I think the kind of the kind of the point with cliche is that like you're you're dealing with a selection that is not really yours, like it's just an amalgamation of a whole bunch of mm -hmm. you know things that you've heard, mm -hmm. you know either that you've read or you've seen in media or something like that, and you're and especially something like this where they're just all just coalescing together and they're just you know cliche after cliche after cliche. So if there were one cliche here that you would try to adjust, any examples, ideas, how would you fix this? Just one. Can you fix one? When you say fix, do you mean like... Make it better. Make it better, okay. Um, Let's maybe talk about the first line. What does the first line even mean? If you had to hazard a guess, that would be. Just sunset. Okay. Oh, is it day last night this time? But. but uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's weird. It's like the sun sinks slow, which I think kind of invites the image of like, like almost like in a metaphorical sense of like things, like darker times coming. You know what I mean? They kind of, you know, okay. if I'm bringing in another token reference, like whenever, like that's when like, like orcs can't go into the light of day, I'm right? Of <laughs> orcs. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but it's like, like, so that, that invites to me, like this thought of like, you know, darker times are coming, but it's weird because then a stitch in time to save the day. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't make sense to me because. Maybe okay. Maybe it's like as the sun is sinking low, this right now, while the sun is not set, is a stitch in time to save the day. 
I don't know if it's written. Good luck, actually. Um, so I guess the key thing for me is uh, this, uh, the sun six plus. So I have that sense of something about sunset and darkness. And for me, this second part, if I had to just try to piece something together, my guess is would be something something positive. There's this sense that something was just enough to save the day, to leave me in a better condition or avoid some sort of danger. Does our band or is they have to be Cool. We are talking a little bit about cliche. Cool. Just throw you right into the fire. Okay. Um, so the sun sinks low, that to me, again, is kind of suggesting, again, sunset darkness. I don't know how to feel about that yet. Is it, am I supposed to have a positive association or supposed to have a negative association? I think it's one of the things that can be problematic with cliches. You don't know what to associate with it. But then a stitch in time to save the day, to me, again, feels positive. So there's some sort of positive relationship with the sunset. And maybe that would be something that the rest of the stanza, the rest of the poem would explore. So if I were, if I were working on this poem, and this is my first draft, these would be the kind of things I'd be wanting to think about in that first line. Okay, like what's the actual intention behind the words? And once I can have that in mind, like, oh, so this is, this is the goal of the line. This is what the line is trying to express. Then I can be like, okay, now maybe I can formulate some new words to convey that from an editing perspective. Other questions for me about the topic of cliche. And again, we identified some cliches. Again, like the sun sinks low, a stitch in time, saving the day, night creeps in. These are just phrases we've heard and seen over and over again. And so we're trying to make them feel fresh. I don't know if I would say it's pop, because I, I think there's like a, it, to me, it feels like there is a need for something positive. And that keeps in keeping the dark at bay. So like maybe, I don't know, yeah, I, that's, that's messy. <laughs> yeah, it feels like there's a need for something positive, which to me is the antithesis of something positive or the current situation is not positive or it's getting less positive, maybe. I mean, I think it implies that there's, there is something negative yeah. happening and something's helping me avoid that negativity. We don't have to save these poems. These poems are written by Chat GPT. Like uh, these are <laughs> these are not. This is not. In the interest of time, let's take a look at our third point. We're looking at six things that Mary Oliver in her book, A Poetry Handbook, has told us to avoid if we're trying to make our poems better. If we're trying to be better poets, let us take a look at our third one. The third point that Mary Oliver brings up is the idea of inversion. Take a look at this poem and tell me, what does inversion mean? Through winds so cold, my heart doth stray. So it's through the winds that my heart strays. Does he find this line a little bit confusing? Yeah. Structural? Okay. More inversion? Is it more like just the structure of the sentence itself? Like, it is. Like, it's just like a complicated way to say it when you could just say it, you know? Disruption of the syntax. I don't remember the part of speech, but instead of in dreams of what I find my way, I find my way in dreams of what Exactly. Yeah. My heart does shrink through wind so cold. It does seem a world of shadows. The cards, the stars do gleam beneath the moon. Kind of Yoda. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So why do poets do this? We see poets do this. I'm sorry. For the the rhyme they, to think of it. rhyme. I think the big thing you see this is in poets that rhyme. Yeah, I do you, you see this. You see this in rhyming poems. But why do we do this in rhyming poems? It's because if I write it the normal way, the rhyme's not going to work because right. the rhyme's going to be in the first half, but I need it in the second half. So what do I do? I Let me just yeah. It's like I I'm going to have ions, but I need trochees. Like and you know there's all these things going in. So. The end result is this. I'm sorry? Reminds me of this nice song I once heard. It's called Rewind. The whole rhyme was him telling the story backwards. 
Yeah, that's a good one. You know, I, th I think there's one um, doing with intentionality versus doing it to force a rhyme, which yeah. I think is the one of the biggest culprits. Or you mentioned some of your poems are like rhyming ones. I've heard it. Right. Um, that could pretty much all I. <laughs> so what do we think of this? I think it can be a good thing if used sparingly, like, and especially in a way if you can like work it into like a double entendre. Okay. But if you're using it like every time as like a cheat code, then it, it's cheap. It is, you know. I think it's a good way to tell a story. I think a word of caution, I would say, because I definitely lean with Mary in terms of this is in general, you know, all rules can be broken in the right situation, but I think in general, it's not my first option. It's not my plan A. Right. I'm going to try to find a plan A and if nothing else is going to work, maybe I'll do this, but maybe it's going to be even better to just not do it at all and just like leave the thing out. I don't know. Like it's, it can be very difficult to incorporate in a way that sounds natural because it just, it doesn't flow from the lips. You know, it's like, it's, dis it's very disjointed. It also feels like very, so like, like in uh, Romeo and Juliet, like not even in like the play, or well, like not in the, the the written out play, but like in Romeo's poem to like his ex or something like that. It sounds like that, right? So it's like this very sing songy kind of, you know, writing this like kind of, which I think that style of writing, it's very hard to contemporize. It's very hard to probably match whatever you're writing about right now. And so, you know, just as much as what you're writing about in its content, you want to reflect like what you're, like the times or whatever you're writing about. So it's like, that's like, if I'm like, oh man, I had a rough day at work driving my 2002 Toyota Corolla or something like that. It's like that, like I'm listening to that and that feels very like Elizabethan, mm -hmm. you know, old timey. It's very anachronistic, right? It just it doesn't, it feels very disconnected from the world we live in right now. And you're not fooling anybody. People, <laughs> people know what you're doing. We know that you don't know how to rhyme, so you have to do this, you know? Um, so be careful with this device. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. Just be careful, especially if you know you're doing it. Not to name names. <laughs> That's number three. We're halfway done. We got six. Here's our next one. The fourth thing that Mary Oliver identifies for us is something called informational language. Take a moment, read through this. And tell me, what does informational language mean? What is the meaning of informational language? I'm going to say it's paid for because you're giving out information about the subject. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? So in this particular place, I don't know what any of that stuff means. <laughs> so whoever write it is writing it, I'm going to say from their perspective, and they're trying to give information to the audience maybe to help them understand it maybe. So it's just like, I mean, they're probably going to lose their audience if the audience is there who they don't know what they're talking about. But it looks like the person is trying to inform them of what they are talking about. But so it can get a little confusing depending on the audience. Right. Like me, that's like me if I was like pulling out building a computer, but I'm talking to people who don't even know what a 60 FPS is or high frame rate right. or fidelity, they will be lost. It's like overly specific <laughs> on the details. Overly specific on the details. I like that. Name. Other thoughts on informational language? It's fun sometimes, even if you know you're gonna lose the audience, because you know sometimes it's not for them; it's for you, like in a way. Or it's for that specific audience. Like I think that's an important thing with audience. I think a lot of times we don't think about audience for right. work enough. There's almost like this idea we're right for everybody. It's like you're never right for everybody. Yeah, you, um, <laughs> you know, there are people that could read this and maybe get something right, that out of it and enjoy like, it. You know, oh, so I relate to that. I like working with work. So I feel like we, we almost have to kind of put that stipulation in that, like assuming, you know, audience aside. Right. I, I think some of the issues that we mentioned here with the informational languages, it doesn't, it can not even feel like you're reading a poem. It can feel like yeah. you're reading an instruction manual. Yeah. Right. Besides, this was the best chat GPT could do. Okay. Like it's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not going to be like the best. No, I can <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
I, I think I do think so. You have to put that qualifier though. It's like okay, if you're new, not not respective to like audience, if you're like okay, well, I'm, if you're making the attempt to appeal to even a greater amount of people, maybe. But I'm like, it also depends on you know what is the subset. What is your I guess what is your goal with like if you have a specific goal like I want this poem to relate to this audience or this audience or this audience then maybe something like this is not going to be as well received I do think that there is an audience that I so this feels like you know naturally a probably an excerpt from a poem as opposed to a poem itself and so, to me, I would be like, I don't know what context that this might land in, but there might be a context where, like, this seems, like, out of reach for your, your the layman, you know what I mean? It feels, like, out of reach for the layman. But it's, like, there's plenty of poems that, like, they're, they have sections or they have things that are, if you took out of context, you're like, okay, I'm not going to really understand that. But because there might be some adventure in a little bit of research, or there might be just some adventure in being like, you know, what can I get from this from context? So it's like, it, it just depends on what you want from that poem. Um, because, you know, I'm sure there's other subjects, and it's just like, you know, if you're an anime fan, if you're a Star Trek fan, if you are somebody who works specifically on water purifiers, that like if you're writing a poem about water purifiers, it's like maybe there's things. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like maybe there's things about this specific subject that are it's, it's going to feel inaccessible to most people that you're going to be able to lock in like somebody that works on air purifiers and just knows a lot of everybody. Like man, look at this deep, and like maybe that's maybe you're fine with that. Like, I think, even looking at this, like, this is not the ideal example I had in mind for technical. It, it, I think the last line starts to get there a little bit, like, then Torque will suspect, yeah. 20, like, that line is a bit heavy. I think there's ways that, I think we've had sections where, I see this a lot, for instance, with prose poems. A lot of people writing prose poems, and they're like, I'm trying to write a prose poem, but it ends up being prose, and I think part of the reason that often happens is we almost get we know too much we get too deep into the specific details and so we start adding in the information that leans more into prose because prose you can get into that really rich description in a lot of ways but a lot of times poems aren't able to get to that certain level of specificity um, to that same degree over the same amount of time you know and so I think it's a balance like for instance here I think there's elements, like if I were working on this, there's elements I would make keep, but there's also probably some else, uh, you know, we could probably adjust some of these details a little bit to just tone it down slightly. I feel like the name of that poem is like Cabinets. Cabinets. <laughs> <laughs> My Cabinets. <laughs> we're on number four, so that means we're going to be moving on to number five out of six. Can I get a time check, guys? What time is it? It's 7.30. 7.30? Let's touch on that in a moment. Why is that happening? I think the line structure is like, is kind of demanding that because it's demanding that the, the rhyme, the rhyme scheme happens in the kind of the amount of syllables of sky and amber hues and gentle light. I don't disagree. I want to. I want to piggyback more on Urban's point too, because I think he's onto oh. it. What's missing? Point. <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. Something. Sorry. There's something really big that's missing here. Not one single line has it. Anywhere. There's not one of these in any line. And it's fundamental in English. A period? Yeah. It has periods, but think <laughs> more, but dig on that a little bit more. How do you get a period in English? What do you need? Uh, the end of the sentence. Hey, uh, what do you need for a sentence? Subject. Subject, but even more important than that. There it is. There's no verb. Oh, yeah. 
There's no verb. <laughs> you can't even really have a period if you don't even have a verb. Like, there's, there's no action. Oh, you know confusion coming. <laughs> so there, there's, you know, there's like participles and things like that, but there's no actual verb. And I think this leads into something that you mentioned earlier. Like, you, you, you're like, what's the point? It feels like there's no, pro there's no movement. There's no progression. We're stuck. We're static. You know, and obviously maybe you can kind of get away with it and it stands in maybe, but like, you know, these are long lines, first of all, and to have yeah. four of them in a row with not a single verb, we're, we're, we're frozen in time. You can't go anywhere. You're literally stuck. Okay. So something that I think is important to be mindful of is that in your own poems, maybe we need to stick another verb in there somewhere, you know, let's, let's because if you don't, there can literally be no progression. The verbs are the only thing that move time forward. Okay. And some verbs are better at doing that than others. Okay. So in English, there's things called like stative verbs, which are just like, they just bring you a condition. You know, like um, if I say the soup tastes good, that's not really advancing time. It's just a condition. Or if I say, oh, I have a cat. That's not really advancing time either. It's just possession. Okay. The verb to be. Like, I am tall. Again, th these are verbs that don't really advance action on their own. So we want to be thinking about some dynamic verbs to kind of propel ourselves forward. Because otherwise, if you do this sustained over time, we get stuck. And you can have some really nice flowery language, but it can be hard. Really pretty, but kind of pointless. Yeah. Because I'm not interested in nice poems. Right. Or like, oh, that was fun to read. Right. Like, if you're going for impact, no, no I, I want to write the poem that people come back to. They actually think about This ain't it. It's pretty. You know? <laughs> but pretty gets forgotten. Right. You know? Yeah, it sounds nice. But yeah, it sounds nice, but... You know, you know, it's yeah. No meaning is like, where's the other Yeah. Other thoughts on just syntax? I'm just thinking about how for each of these, like I've seen examples of the thing done well. Oh. Not this, not like <laughs> this. <laughs> Definitely not this. <laughs> no, but like for each example, whether it be like poetic description mm -hmm. or syntax or there was another one. Like the inversion and like the, maybe not. Oh, yeah, maybe inversion. But, but I've seen like the intentional one where it's done um, like one of uh, exercise that really um, I feel like gave me a concept of the way that syntax is po like it's possible to play with syntax was an exercise where um, I was asked to write pieces pulling out certain like parts of the so like you can mm -hmm. write a piece and you can only use verbs. Mm -hmm. Or you can write a piece and you can only use a certain part of speech, or you cannot, you have no access to certain parts, so right. you cannot use any nouns or pronouns. And, and, and thinking about um, the ways you can intentionally disrupt syntax without slowing down your poem, or intentionally disrupt syntax to make it something that's more interesting. Um, and this being, again, resting, resting in the flex, which is actually not doing it. I think that's the big. I don't want to speak for Mary. I can only guess her intentions. The way I, I view her work is that she's especially focused on the, the poets who are doing this almost like absentmindedly. You're writing this and this is what you end up with. Like it's habit. And it's just, yeah. you haven't actually put thought into realizing what you're doing. Yeah. This is just the end product. Intentionality, mm -hmm. like what Ajane is talking about, like, oh, I'm using a prompt where I literally have to do this. It's a whole different ballgame, right? It's interesting that Irving just mentioned the word habit as well, because that brings us to our final. Six for six. Thanks to Ajane Massage for hanging with us. That's cool. Um, final point, Mary Oliver brings up six things that poets need to avoid doing. Our last one is habit. What's habit? What's the habit in this poem? It seems kind of like the first one, you are putting an obvious statement. It's kind, of, it's kind of similar to cliches. Like it's obvious, the twilight sun glows, it's obvious the breeze flows, it's obvious moon, light has shadows. It's so glow. 
Where where does it say? Something? Tell oh, me man. more about that. Tell me more. Right. Well, I think, tell me more. Like the first two lines, first each line. have a form of soft. Soft, soft. The fourth one does. Where? Uh, so softly soft. knife. Uh huh. And then the third one didn't. Like if you okay. Had. What else do you see? Glow. Where do you see glow? The first line. The fourth line. Jeez. Wow. This guy's yeah. redundant. <laughs> so and grow in the second and third. Has this ever happened to you where you write a poem like, oh, this is a great poem, then you read it again, crap, I said the word three ten times. Like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know I did that until yeah. I read it again. Okay. There should be like, I mean, if you're going to do that, there should be some intent. Like, there's some like, poems that intentionally do that, mm -hmm. but you can see like this was no. an intention. It was just like, oh, I didn't let me no. reach for a descriptive word. Oh, glow again. We have to be careful with our vocab choice because it's easy for them to enter into our blind spots. And this is where distance is really helpful. So then you can see like, oh, now I see that I use that same word. Or for instance, you can do like, if you, if you type your poems like on the document, you like control F keywords to see do they appear more than once, things like that. Just kind of check yourself. Ajani, I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, that's, I was going to say one of the things that I do is I have a running list of words that like I overuse. I overuse the word ghost. I love that word. I love <laughs> blood. I love blood. Are you talking like across poems? Huh? Like multiple across poems. So this isn't even just in one poem. She's just talking about that <laughs> Which is which is kind of hard, yeah. right? Because like sometimes if you have a collection, that repetition of word choice can be empowering because it like it creates a theme. But then on the other hand, it can be something that, you know. Yeah, and then the way, something that helps um, is when I read books, like when I read a collection, when I see words that stand out to me, I'm like, oh, I don't think I've used this word in a poem. I make word banks of, I like keep a word bank from every book that I use. So right now I'm trying to figure out how to work duty into one of my poems. Okay. I'm excited. Feel that. Watch your words. You know, check yourself. Try to keep it fresh. This is something I could have been avoided. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't even know. When I get like that, I just go look at other words that have the same center of meaning, see if I can make them fit. <laughs> And they're also, I mean, I think one of the things that shows how they were unintentional is that essentially they were being used in virtually the same way every time. So like the twilights glow and then the stars glow. I'm like, these these things are the same. Yeah, yeah. Everything glows. And yeah, <laughs> but it's, I mean, when you're saying twilights glow, you are saying yeah. stars right. glow, you know right. what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so. Or, or sometimes even opening up to it, be like, okay, I'm gonna do it, this repetition, but I'm gonna let people know it's intentional. Like for instance, like um, I've had in poems where a poem will end on like a character, like a poem will end on my son, but then the next sentence, the very next sentence starts with my son. So then like it gets that yeah. doubling, which is very intentional, like owning up to it and playing with it that way. Cause it's a little bit unexpected. People don't expect you to repeat the same word twice in such a close proximity. So there's I, things you can I do. I like a piece once that's called uh, Stress Fractures. We are like, it's just about how fucking like, I don't know, like how it's like borderline suicidal. Like, not like really, but you know, like that was the whole gist of it. But just every time like it got to the point where it was getting really dark, it was just like stress fractures. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. But it was like intentional. But like when I reread it when I was done, I was like, damn, it's fucking dark. And <laughs> yeah, like nice. it was like I liked writing it, but then when it was done, I was like, trash. I mean, you can play with that. Like I, I've read poems, like um, one of my friends, that's Sarah. She she has a hoarding poem, and so what she did was throughout the poem, she's like just spreading. Like she'll have a line, but then every couple of words, she'll just throw in a random object, just like what <laughs> things you would encounter just from hoarding or like going through like a hoarder's house, oh, nice. um, and things like that. So as always, intentionality changes the game a bit. We're talking about situations where you're just kind of ending up doing these things that we want to be mindful of. Okay. I know we're trying to be mindful of time. So on that note, these are six things that you want to be avoiding if you are trying to follow Mary Oliver's The Poetry Handbook and you're also trying to become a better poet. <laughs>